Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest, Jay Billis, has quite the resume. ESPN talent, lawyer, author, coach, and Emmy nominee. If you're a sports fan, you'll recognize Jay as a college basketball analyst for ESPN, where he covers the marquee matchups and co-hosts College Game Day. Or you might know him by his Twitter handle, at Jay Billis, where he's amassed almost 2 million followers. A four-year starter at Duke, Jay played for coaching legend Coach K, and helped the Blue Devils to the 1986 national title game. Drafted by the NBA's Dallas Mavericks, Jay instead played professionally overseas in Italy and Spain before returning to Duke to join Coach K's staff while earning his law degree. Since 1992, he's been an attorney with the law firm Moore and Van Allen, specializing in commercial litigation. An outspoken critic of the NCAA and unafraid to push for change. Jay has been named one of the 10 most powerful voices in sports media by The Hollywood Reporter and one of the 25 most powerful people in college sports by Forbes. We're going to dig into all of that and more, including his book, Toughness. Let's get started. Here's my conversation with Jay Billis. Well, Jay Billis, what a treat to have you on. Thanks for taking a minute. No, thank you for having me, Molly. It's my pleasure. So, you know, your resume includes professional basketball player, coach, lawyer, author, and, of course, broadcaster. How would you describe your career journey? Uh, Circuitous. Uh, (laughs) You know, I grew up in in Los Angeles, California, uh, not far from the water, at a place called Rolling Hills. And... uh, and my parents were, I think I would describe it as they had a very healthy fear of my failure. So my, my parents expected me to go to college and be cultured and have a uh, have something to fall back on thing. You know, it, it, that was always discussed. And my dad especially thought that I should go to law school. He, he really believed, and my, my parents never had the opportunity to go to college, but my dad really believed that a law degree was the most versatile. And he would always tell me, you don't have to be a lawyer. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people have law degrees, they go on to other things, but, but you'll always be able to handle your own affairs. And then, uh, and then the thing he said, and if things get tough, you can always hang out a shingle and make a good living. And so I went to law school without the intention of becoming a lawyer. I didn't really want to be a lawyer when I started law school. Uh, I was doing it for the education and I was an assistant coach at, at Duke at the time. I was a graduate assistant uh, where I played. And so I did both those things. And when I got married, my wife and my fiance and I decided uh, that coaching probably wasn't the best thing for, for the family situation we were looking for. So I started practicing law. That's really how it happened. It was more out of not, not necessarily necessity, but it was a, an option that I had. And so I took that for the the best sort of the best interests of my family, and it was really more of a thing where I didn't want my wife because I, I coaching was what I wanted to do, at least it's what I thought I wanted to do, and I wasn't going to make my wife do something that she wasn't all in on, and it was it was going to be our life and our decision, and I wasn't going to make that um, on my own, and so we decided what was best for us, and it's it's worked out worked out really well for us. Sure. Well, and I know I've heard you talk about how your mom also really helped you always want to get you always wanted to get you out of your comfort zone. Right. Do you think at some level that it was a part in, in, in you leaning into so much versatility and being able to thrive in all these roles along the way? Oh, yeah. And that was sort of the, the point about the, the cultured thing. Like my mom did not want me to be some kind of knuckle dragging Neanderthal <laughs> athlete, which was her, her view of me at the time when I, when I was playing, uh, she wanted me to be able to, to walk into any situation. And she always used to talk about, you know, you have to be qualified to go to the college of your choice. Like you have to be the one to say no, uh, no, nobody, you, you want to put yourself in the position where nobody gets to say no to you. And so my grades were obviously very important to her. And she pushed me, like she made me take 
I, I say, I, I try to be as kind as I can here. <laughs> I say encourage. She encouraged me, but she made me. Okay. I, I had to take I had to take ballroom dancing uh, uh, courses, and I kept that a profound secret from my friends. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> and it turned out that we that I I was actually pretty decent at it, and and because the instructors, uh, uh, her my instructor's name was Margaret Michael. She was a a champion ballroom dancer in her day. And she put me in ballroom dancing competitions with a partner, the, an older girl that she had partnered me up with. And we actually won some things. And those trophies were never displayed in my home. Right. I, they, 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 they weren't in my room. They were, they were about as far away from Sykes. I didn't want my friends to know I was doing that. And then she got me into public speaking courses and all that stuff and forensics. And I wound up meeting a, uh, one of my teachers was a gentleman named Billy Kramer, who was a, a drama teacher and an English teacher. And it just so happened that he went from my intermediate school to my high school about the time that, that I went to high school. So I had him for probably seven straight years as a teacher. And he was as big an influence on me as any coach or any teacher I ever had and uh, got me into into drama when I really, you know, I was an active kid, but I didn't really want to do that. And he, he got me into that and got me into all these forensics competitions where we went around Southern California and I had to go into these speaking uh, uh, competitions, whether it was uh, extemporaneous speaking or impromptu, where you would get a topic. And one of them, I can't remember which it was, extemporaneous or impromptu, you get like five minutes to come up with with a speech and you have to give it in front of a three judge panel and they grade you on it and you, you moved on if you did well. And then one was they handed it to you and you had to do it right there. I mean, you didn't get any time to think about it. And so I, I still not, Molly, encountered anything that I've done, whether standing in front of a judge in federal court or or being on television, uh, doing a game or in the studio or speaking in a in a large crowd, that scared me as much as that. Uh, no, no <laughs> wow. little red light on top of a on top of a camera <laughs> wow. is going to scare me the way that scared me. Wow! And now you've got a little more than three judge panels. Right. Yeah, but the but the beauty of it now is is you can't see them. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah that's true. <laughs> you there you, you go. don't know what people that are helps. thinking while you're saying it. You just find out later. <laughs> exactly. You know, at what point, Jay, did you decide to trade? You know, you know, your law career, of course, for for broadcasting for TV, and how did that come about? Well, when I first started practicing law, I, I got a job uh, with a big law firm. I'm still with the firm called Moore and Ben Allen in Charlotte, and I started practicing as a, a commercial litigator, and and I, I started in bankruptcy actually, but. Uh, you know, I was a young lawyer and just trying to find out where the copy machine was and all that. And I got a phone call from a guy named George Habel, who was the president of the Capital Sports Network. And he wanted to have lunch and sat down and, and asked me if I would be interested in doing some radio games uh, and for, for Duke basketball. And I had just left Duke as an assistant coach. So, you know, I knew the program and, and I thought, you know what, this might be fun. And I'd always wanted to, to, to be a broadcaster and get into it, but I thought, well, it's just not possible. I, how could I do this? And I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to do this. And if I don't like it or if it negatively affects my law practice, I'll quit. But why would I quit before I tried it? I, I made $200 a game um, plus some gas expenses and and whatever airline ticket I needed. And it was really difficult because back then, this is in the uh, – early mid nineties back then you, you couldn't work remote like you can now. So I had to, I had to get to a game. Then I had to get back in the office and, you know, I did some overnighters and to make sure my, my billing hours were, were where they needed to be. And I was taking care of my clients, but one thing led to another and, and somebody heard me and I got offered a game on ESPN and then I got more and, and it came a time, um, you know, seven years, eight years into my law practice where I needed to make a decision because I couldn't do both anymore. And uh, and I chose the one that was more fun. So yeah. I, I went with the broadcasting. <laughs> well, I mean, I always think little moments can create really big outcomes. And, and that was sort of a little moment of discomfort, really, that you leaned into and it changed your life. Yeah. And, and you know, I always I always look back on something that uh, a really good friend and mentor of mine said, named Kevin Eastman. You know, he's, he's one of the best basketball teachers I've ever met, coaching college, the NBA. And he said, never say no to a basketball opportunity. He wound up getting his job as an assistant coach with the Boston Celtics because he was unemployed. He'd been fired as a, a head basketball coach in college. And he got a phone call uh, to speak at a clinic down in Mississippi, I think it was. And he was living in Virginia and he had to be there the next day. 
And so he jumped in his car and he drove to Mississippi, spoke at the clinic, and he met Doc Rivers there and established a relationship with Doc Rivers. And Doc Rivers wound up hiring him to be an assistant coach with the Celtics. Yeah, that's how it works. I mean, if you, your point about comfort zone, it's really jobs go and opportunities go to the people who show up. And I decided that I was going to show up to this radio gig and I was going to take, I was going to treat every game like it was a championship game or like the whole world was watching or listening because the people who were listening, it might not have been a big audience, but the people who were listening were interested and it was important to them. And, and so, you know, you wound up oddly enough, uh, the games back then, the Duke basketball games were carried on a station in Charlotte called WBT. And I didn't know how radio worked, but at night, uh, the radio signal from WBT tra- uh, traveled up and down the East coast. So, so people in New York could hear a game that was coming from, from Charlotte. And, and I was told, who knows, it, it might be urban myth now, but I was told somebody heard me. And that's uh, that's sort of how it how one way that it happened where I started getting some some more work. You know, your your legal background, obviously, it serves you well in covering, you know, the business side of sports. And, I, you know, you've spoken up about the NCAA and, and, and athlete compensation. What are the biggest changes that you think need to be made in, in college sports? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I just think it needs to be honest about what it is. You know, when I was in college, I was a, a member, an athlete representative of the of the NCAA's Long Range Planning Committee, and I think the some of the powers that be now are probably not happy that they let me behind the curtain to see how everything <laughs> worked. But I, I learned about policy and how policy was made, and I disagreed with the policy. But back then, in those meetings, when I would voice my concerns and they would be dismissed, I didn't go outside the the meeting room door and tell the media what I thought. I was a I was a, a party line guy, and uh, and when a decision was made, I supported the decision, even though I didn't agree with it. But that's not my job anymore. And so I, I made a conscious decision a few years in to my job with ESPN that, you know, I really started analyzing, you know, my job is to analyze and report on the entire sport, which includes policy. So if I, if I see a coach make a decision on the floor that I disagree with, I say so during the game. Or if I see a, a, an official make a decision, I, I, I say so. If I don't like a rule of play, you know, if, if I wanted the shot clock down to 30, I said so. And, uh, and I, I was like, why am I pulling punches on NCAA policy? So I stopped doing that. I started saying what I, what I thought. And to your original question, I think, I think the first thing that needs to happen is the NCAA needs to allow, and all the member institutions by extension, needs, needs to allow uh, athletes the same economic rights as literally everyone else. There's no student other than a college athlete that is told what they can earn or accept on whether on scholarship or not. And there's become this narrative that somehow the players get scholarships, therefore they're paid. Well, first of all, I don't buy that. It's not, if they're paid, if we say that's paid, then the pay is limited to that only. And that would be a a federal antitrust violation has been, and Mm -hmm. oddly enough, that's being litigated right now. (laughs) Right. But, uh, uh, you know, we don't tell other students get scholarships. One, we don't call that pay. And two, we don't tell them that, that that's all they get and that's all they're allowed. They're, they're allowed to go out. A, a, a student on a music scholarship is allowed to go out and cut a record or appear in a movie or, you know, play at a local bar, uh, a restaurant and, and, and accept whatever they whatever they can. Student journalists, whatever. There are a lot of students that make money while they're on scholarship, while they're in school. And athletes are sold literally for billions of dollars. And there, there's no reason no legitimate reason in my judgment why they should be limited to a scholarship only that, that to me that I've always had a problem with that. Uh, I've never believed that it was fair or right. And I think it's, uh, it's a contradiction to the point of hypocrisy. I happen to believe Molly that everybody knows it and that the pandemic has put the final nail, uh, into, into that, that we're, we're, you know, we're done being able to say this isn't pro sports anymore. It, it's major league pro sports. Mm-hmm. So what, Jay, do you think college sports could look like, should look like in five years or in 10 years? I think it should look like the rest of the rest of society. I mean, I, I just I don't think the world would crumble if athletes are allowed to bargain for fair market value, <laughs> whether it's for their name, image and likeness or for their services just to play in the first place. We would never have a problem with, uh, uh, you know, a student trainer bargaining for 
what he or she was worth and in, in offering those services up. Uh, similarly for uh, a journalist, whatever, we would never have a, a concern about that. And there's no, the only reason we have a concern with it in football and basketball is this idea of, of competitive balance. You know, people think that, oh, if, if Alabama can pay people, uh, pay players, then they will be the best team. Well, first of all, they're the best team now, but we don't, we don't have any, we don't have any spending controls in any other area. So rather than paying the players, What's happening now is these schools are creating these lavish environments to attract the players. And it's really the same as paying them. It's just that they're paying themselves uh, uh, by building these facilities. What do you think the timeline is before potentially, right, there could be a shift here? I think we're looking at some sort of shift and decision in the next couple of years because uh, we've had all these different states that have implemented name, image, and likeness rights for for their their states. Whether it's Cal- California started it all, uh, Senator Nancy Skinner out there was uh, uh, the first mover, I believe, in all this, and she is formidable. Uh, you know, the NCAA tried to bully her, and uh, and that did not work out very well. Um, but Florida, a uh, num- number of different states have put legislation through. Florida is going to be, I think, the first one to go into effect. Um, and I think that comes this next summer, if I remember right. Uh, but that's put a lot of pressure on the NCAA to come up with something. But they're, the, the initial rules and guidelines that they're, they're putting forth are so restrictive as to be uh, worthless. So you can, uh, a player can have an endorsement deal, but nothing that conflicts with the university. And nothing in these areas and stuff like that. I mean, it's 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 next to meaningless. It's more like okay, you can like a tennis player can go out and give tennis lessons now by using your name, but Zion Williamson can't have a shoe deal that conflicts with with Duke's Nike deal. That's frankly absurd, and uh, and that needs to change because they're worried about everybody's worried about. They think it's their money. This is going to take some of our money. They don't look at it as the players deserve to compete for for dollars in the marketplace. And, you know, Molly, it's funny. There are some people that that listen to kind of what I say in these policy areas and they say, well, you benefit off this. And I say, yeah, I do. But I work for a company that pays its employees like we're, we're not, you know, the media is not the one. Media companies aren't the ones telling players what they can and cannot have. And they say, well, if you don't like it, you should quit. And I don't I don't see it that way. Uh, just like, you know, if I don't if I differ with with government policy. I don't think I have to keep my mouth shut or leave the country. I don't think those are my right. options. <laughs> right. Like I think we can hash through this and come up with a with a good system. But the NCAA starts at the players get zero, and then we'll discuss how much they get. My position is nope, the players get everything. And if you have a reasonable restriction that you think benefits not only the players but the entire enterprise, then we can talk about it th- then. But we start with full economic rights, not we start with zero. And that that's a fundamental difference that I think uh, the NCAA has with, with sort of the rest of the world. Well, and what comes up for me when you and you're so much closer to this than I am, of course. But, I, you know, when, when you think about brands that are associated with universities and you think about exclusivity with the athlete, brands could activate their deals with universities by engaging the athlete and, and compensating the athlete to activate that endorsement deal at a higher level, potentially in those markets. And they could bring these relationships to life more. Exactly. And I think what you're one of the things you're saying is there are more revenue streams by allowing the university mark and the athlete's name, image and likeness to be used together. And those are decisions that are made every day uh, by professional leagues, whether it's the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NFL, uh, you know, it, where they combine the, the, the mark of the team or the league with with the player's image and likeness. And, and they can all make those decisions. And the players agree that they're going to wear the uh, uh, the team sponsored gear, but they can wear their own shoes. And in their off time, they can wear their own brand, uh, whatever they contract with. But they wear their uh, in in team activities. They wear their team gear. It's it works really easily. And you know, it's amazing how the free market works for everyone else except college athletes. I've never bought that. And and if we want to keep the myth or facade or whatever, whatever you want to call it, that these athletes are pure and all of them, our, uh, all of the athletes uh, have never taken a nickel. That's a lie. They have, there are very few, if any championship banners in football or basketball that have been hung up that did not have ineligible players. 
Now, whether they were ineligible for taking hundreds of thousands of dollars or a few dollars or services here or a free meal here, whatever the the, the degree of it is, nobody has a, an eligible roster. They just don't. You're not going to have good players that are all eligible under this system. It's kind of like saying, you know, I have a driver's license and I have a clean driving record. And assuming I've never exceeded the speed limit, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is a big topic. There's no doubt. And I know you're uh, right inside of it and have, um, you know, shared a lot of stuff, which is cool. I mean, you don't have to do that. Right. And, and by doing it, obviously, I'm sure you have to deflect at some level, potentially uh, some feedback. Right. Good and bad. How do you delineate between you know, the noise and, and, and what actually is, are things that can be helpful, right? Because you probably get in a little bit of both as a public figure. Yeah. Well, for, first on the NCAA stuff, uh, you know, I haven't gotten a ton of pushback from NCAA people. I know they disagree. I can tell you uh, my, my willingness, I guess, if you'd call it that to speak out on issues that I think are important or, or require a coverage in my opinion on it, my judgment it has cost me money. I've been told by NCAA partners that that I've done endorsement deals with that the NCAA tried to talk them out of it uh, and ask them not to not to engage with me. I know that's happening, but that's business. You know, I'm not going to go sue the NCAA or anything. And and that's that's part of this too. Is you know, people say, well, you need you need to keep quiet. I go, hey, I've never sued the NCAA. All these lawsuits are coming from other people, not me. And my stance is probably if players get name, image, and likeness rights, that's going to cost me money in the future. Uh, because if players are available for endorsement deals, it's less likely somebody's going to want some announcer to do it. My endorsement potential is greater if the athletes remain amateur because there are fewer options for uh, for endorsements. Um, now, if you if you want you know public figure, you're going to have to go to somebody like me or, or, or others because we're the only the athletes aren't available. Uh, so that's part of it. But on the criticism side, very early on in my career. I made the conscious decision that um, I, I readily accept compliments, so I'd better be prepared to readily accept criticism. Mm -hmm. And the way I look at it is if it's right and it's reasonable, uh, I act upon it. So if somebody says something to me or about me uh, that, that's right and it's reasonable, I consider it and I act upon it. If it is un wrong or unreasonable, I dismiss it um, and I don't worry about it. You can't reason with unreasonable, so I'm not going to argue with it. I'm not going to get upset about it. I don't have any problem. You know, I get to give my opinion. Everybody else give theirs. And so I don't quarrel with somebody's somebody saying what they what they choose. Um, it's just a question of whether I internalize it, uh, I let it bother me, or if I respond to it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and how I respond to it. And, and I only deal with reasonable criticism. And if it's right, uh, I accept it. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a good way to manage your energy effectively, right? Because that can be a major energy suck, right? If you get sucked into that madness. Well, yeah. And I, I kind of, I, I always remind myself of this is you may take in this job, you take criticism, but you take a ton of compliments too. Mm -hmm, sure. And, and I never question whether somebody's qualified or, or, you know, they, they've done their homework when they compliment me. I'm certainly not going to do that when they, uh, you know, when they have criticism. That's a cool way to look at it. Well, especially if it's a matter of taste. If it's something that's a factual matter, you can deal with that. If it's somebody's judgment on on whether they like you or not, or whether they like what you said or not, oftentimes those are matters of taste, and uh, and I'm not going to argue with somebody on that. I accept that as part of the it's part of the business, and I have zero problem with it. A absolutely zero. You made it. 2021 is here. And with it, you've likely set some new goals and challenges for yourself. Our New Year's resolutions are all about growth. So if you're looking for ways to grow both personally and professionally, check out our Game Changer Leadership Huddles, my new group coaching program. Start 2021 by investing in yourself. The commitment is just 57 minutes once a month. Sign up today at mollyfletcher.com backslash leadership dash huddles and use the discount code new year that's one word new year to get special pricing of 39 dollars a month and you won't want to do this but you can cancel anytime again that's mollyfletcher.com backslash leadership dash huddles discount code new year see you in the huddle
You know, you wrote an article for ESPN.com on toughness, and it went viral. And it's and, and at some level, I think it inspired you to write an entire book about the topic, right? In the book, you talk about some of the misconceptions. How do you define toughness? Jay, how do you define it? Well, it's really about, uh, to me, about uh, persistence, priorities. You know, like My wife is, is probably, she'd kill me for telling you how tall she is, but she's probably 5'5", five, five, maybe 5'6". Five, if, if that, she might be less than that. I'm giving her too much credit. She says average, um, <laughs> but she's petite and, and uh, the sweetest person you've ever met in your life. But she's also maybe the toughest person I've ever met because she's got her priorities uh, fully in line. Um, you know, she knows what to say no to and because she wants to say yes to what her priorities are. Yeah, she made that really, really clear to me. And, and so I, I look at it that way. It's not about you know, how much pain you can endure and all that stuff. Although that that's, that's certainly an issue for, for an athlete. It's more about, you know, your mental approach to things. And for a basketball player, uh, I boiled it down to, you know, a tough player is easy to play with and hard to play against. Mm. That's sort of the way I looked at it. And, you know, when I was a kid, you had coaches that always talked about being tough and toughness and all that, and nobody ever defined it for me. And so after the, the article you mentioned came up, I don't even remember how many years this was ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago, maybe longer, where uh, I had I had been watching a game and listening to a commentator just like me. And, and he it happened to be he and he was praising uh, the actions of a player as being tough that I thought was just nothing short of bullying. And for some reason, it irritated me. And so I was motivated to write an article about, I wrote an article. I had not been asked to do it by ESPN. My editor had no idea I was writing it. I wrote it on, on what toughness means in basketball. And I submitted it and said, look, I, I felt strongly about this. I wrote, here it is. If you don't want it, great. But I, I, I thought I'd submit it and they packaged it and put it out. And Molly, I got, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I got feedback, uh, immediately from literally all over the world whether it was from military leaders or, uh, you know, teachers, people in business, uh, coach, obviously coaches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what got the idea. My wife was the one who said, you need to write a book about this and it needs to be more than sports. You know, you need to, you need to consult all your friends and all that stuff. And I did. And my favorite part of the experience, I learned a lot in writing the book, but my favorite part of the experience was that not, not that, you know, someone may have used the book as, as this guide to betterment or whatever. I mean, that, that, that seems a little bizarre to me, but the, the idea that, that people used it w with their team, their business unit, their class as a start to a conversation about what was important to them. And, and the, the notes I've gotten, uh, uh, the stories I've been told by people have been so moving and satisfying and that made everything about that project worthwhile is the fact that that, you know, that was maybe a lit a match for them to to sort of start a fire that they could sit around and talk about what was important to them that would get them better and closer. Because that, that's really a part of toughness is, is being being closer as a group because you're not going to do anything worthwhile by yourself. You're just not. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, it is. It's always about the the lives that you change, right? The lives that you impact. It's cool to hear you talk about it like that. Tell me, is there a story of of an athlete or a coach that 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 you could share that maybe illustrates toughness to you? Well, I mean, one of them. It wasn't really a a, a coach or a, a player. Well, on the player side, uh, I actually told a story about the toughest player I ever played against. Uh, and, and people might think, well, it was Michael Jordan or Ralph <laughs> Sampson or Lynn Bias. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't. It was a guy named John Ebeling, who I played against in, in Italy uh, when I was playing pro ball over there. And he went to Florida Southern University, a Division II school. He was very much like me as an athlete. He was, he was very good as a, a player, but not an NBA player. But he wasn't any different from me athletically. Like it wasn't like he was a better athlete than me or stronger or, you know, could out jump me or all that. It's just he did everything I could do, but he did it relentlessly. Like he he sprinted the floor every time, every shot that went up, he he blocked me out. He put a body on me. And at the end of the game, my first thought was, I don't want to play against that guy again. <laughs> like I don't want any part of that guy. Yeah, right. It really made an impact on me that that do my opponents feel that way about me? 
I don't think they did. You know, after that, it really made an impact that what am I doing to make my opponent's job harder to make to make them want to basically want to quit. And, and it, it didn't require anything beyond attention to what I was doing at the time, like put everything I have into this game. And then when the game's over and that kind of hit home with me with, with a team of mine named Mark Allery, uh, we used to run the mile every year at Duke well, back when I played. And I hated that. I was not a, a distance runner and we ran it for time and it, you know, it was, you know, they put po- everything got posted and, you know, it was a big, big event for us. And, and I decided I, you know, this year I'm going to, I'm going to bust it and I'm going to put, put a great time up. And I really worked at it. I work, I trained for it. I worked out really hard. Uh, and then my college roommate, Mark Allery's my size, about the same athlete. He would argue, he'd argue he was a much better athlete. <laughs> But he really didn't do any of that stuff. He just played pickup ball, worked out, you know, as normal, uh, unless he was running in the middle of the night. And when we ran, I ran my, I ran my best time. I ran like a five thirty mile. Wow. He ran a five eleven. He was back at our apartment before I finished, and I was so mad I couldn't believe it. And I think I had, I, I had said to him, you know, you didn't do a thing there. I worked my tail off for this, and and he kind of nonchalantly said, well, you know, he said the mile is really about how much pain you're willing to endure. And I thought about it. I'm going, man, he's right. Like he was willing to endure more pain than I was for that, that five minutes, five, six minutes. Cause he, he said, he said, how many times have you ever seen anybody fall out from exhaustion? He goes, it just doesn't happen. And he says, you've got another year. That was a, a revelatory moment for me. And I, and I carried on beyond, like I have another gear in, in my preparation for a, a case that I had as a lawyer or in my preparation, how I approach my, uh, my job as a, a broadcaster, you know, I've got another gear. And, uh, so I've always remembered that. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's cool. So how can toughness be coached? Well, I think it, it starts with, uh, your ability to self-evaluate and to stop. Uh, and this is a big one for me. For a lot of people, myself included, or myself especially, like I think I was a world champion rationalizer and excuse maker. Uh, when things didn't go my way when I was younger, my first response was to make an excuse. And it might not have sounded like an excuse, but that's what it was. And so like after there's a failure, uh, whatever it may be, it might just be something that, that is looked upon as a success but, but you failed the ultimate goal. Like, you know, you finished second. Well, that's a success, but you, but you failed to finish first and you have to sort of be able to, to self-evaluate. Why didn't I reach my ultimate goal? Why didn't I perform at the level I had planned for or, or expected, but without beating yourself up over it and being able to do that with still a positive mental attitude about things. Uh, is really important. And and this friend of mine I mentioned about the mile, Mark Allery, was another, he had another thing. You know, back when I played for Coach K, when we played for Coach K, he was a little more, he was a little more aggressive than he is now uh, <laughs> because he was, he was younger and, sure. uh, and not as experienced probably. But we used to have these film sessions and, and you know, when you didn't play well and you're in film, I mean, it is, it, it's like being in a boxing match with your arms tied <laughs> around you. I mean, it's you on. get bloodied. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I came out of one of those things and I got bloodied up pretty good. And I had mentioned something to Allery and, and he says, he says, Oh, whenever that, he goes, I never even look when that that's going on. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, I, I don't look at that. I just look at my feet and I don't pay attention to that. And I'm saying, how can you do that? He says, look, if we're doing something analytical, if, if he's telling us, Hey, we're in the wrong position here, we need to be here, or here's how we need to run this play better. Here's how we can improve. I'm all in. He said, if, if, if I'm going to get beat up, he goes, I'm not put letting anybody put anything negative in my memory bank. He said, I need to, I need to draw on that when things get tough. And, you know, you start thinking about that positive, you know, thinking positive, but being able to self-evaluate to say, okay, I failed here. Why? But, but not, 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 well, I'm a failure. There's a difference between failing and being a failure. And so, and Steve Kerr, who's the head coach of the Golden State Warriors, brought this up to me. Yeah, he, Steve's a great shooter. And before games, he would look at tape of himself doing well and put himself in that mindset. And he, he told me that he was in Houston one time and shot the perfect free throw. All of his uh, routine was great. Uh, follow through, the, the release, ball went beautifully through. And he said, after that, every free throw I shot, 
I would go through my routine. And as I breathed out, I would say Houston and just put himself in, in that position of where he was the most successful, where he felt the best about things and to put himself in that, that mindset. And so if you're, if you're able to self-evaluate and then, but able to also stay positive about things, I think your outcomes will be better. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, you talked about playing for Coach K, right? A legend at Duke. What makes him so special? Well, there are so many things. I, I think one, he's in the moment all the time, which I I think translates to concentrating on what you're doing while you're doing it. Uh, he doesn't look at a season saying, "All right, this is my this is my fortieth uh, year." He looks at it, "Well, this is my this is this team's only year." You know, th- this team, even though some of these guys have played here before. They haven't played here at this age and in this position. They all have new roles. They're all different than they were last year, better, worse, whatever. Uh, and this is the only go around for this team. And and that's exciting for him. And, uh, you know, Jerry Colangelo is the chairman of USA Basketball. When Coach K was deciding to coach the Olympic team the second time, uh, uh, you know, the first time that he coached the Olympic team, it was this sort of redeemed team thing. We got to get the gold medal back. And there was all this rah-rah stuff. And. Uh, it was a tremendous experience. So when, when he was deciding, should I do this again? Um, he had said to Jerry Colangelo, you know, it's not going to be the same this time. And Colangelo's response was, yeah, it's not going to be Isn't that great. <laughs> and, and Interesting. you know, that, that every year is unique Yeah, and it's, it's its own kind of unique journey. And I think he looks at it that way. So he's never bored. He, he's never like, it's not routine to him. And, uh, and that's pretty cool that he, he looks at your opportunity, uh, you know, like if you're a player right now, you're trying to win your first and perhaps only championship. He doesn't look at it as he's trying to win his sixth. Mm-hmm. Wow, he's that's trying to, cool. he's, he's working with you to win your first, at least in my view, he's never lost his energy for his job. And that, that's pretty cool. Like he's different. He coaches differently now. Like he's not, uh, he, not he doesn't run around and practice as much. He doesn't jump in drills mm-hmm. anymore. That's <laughs> natural for you know, he's 70 some years old. That's sure, natural, Sure. but he's not lost his, he's not lost his enthusiasm for the, for the job and, and, and for adapting and uh, changing the way he looks at things. Uh, it, it's really pretty remarkable. But I'm hearing you say too, that what he does, it's not about him. It's, it's about the guys that play for him. I mean, is that what I'm hearing? Well, I think that, I think that's a, a big part of, of any leader is, you know, you hear the, the term servant leadership, but, but it, you know, it's, it's basically a we first attitude. It's putting your people first. Like how can you expect somebody to, uh, you know, we always talk about players running through a wall for their coach or being an extension of their coach, but how, how do you expect players, teammates to put one another first if you're not putting them first? Mm-hmm. And I always talk, I, I run a camp during the summer and part of it's a coach's development, coach's leadership program. So our motto has become, you know, teach the players, coach the coaches. And we often talk to the, the, the coaches about how they treat the players that, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not managing the players or all that stuff. You're working with the players and, and how you treat them uh, is, is really important. And, and I think coach K, you know, takes a holistic approach to things. But if you if you want players to uh, treat one another well and and, you know, be selfless with one another, you got to be selfless with them. And because, uh, you know, players are like horses that way. They, they can they can smell out fear and nonsense and all that. He's very straightforward and honest with his players. Doesn't mean he's not he's not in charge. But, uh, you know, everybody kind of knows that they 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 agree to that system. But there's a there's a difference between being in charge and being a leader. Uh, people don't follow players don't follow the person in charge. They follow the leader. And he's he's been nothing but a leader since he's been there. Mm-hmm, no question. You know, you've seen the game from so many angles. Jay, what are the, what are the characteristics of an ideal teammate right in sports or maybe even by, beyond sports? Well, I, I mean, I've had so many great teammates, uh, not only playing, but, but as a colleague. And I think, I think the, to me, the best teammates are the ones that do their job and they help their, their teammates or their colleagues do theirs. And you have to understand what your teammates are going through in order to be able to help them. All the time, players are going through things. I mean, you, you, a team may be on the same bus, but the players aren't always taking the same trip. 
you have to know whether whether a, a player is is down about an injury or struggling with something. Like, how are you going to help somebody if you don't empathize with them and understand what they're going through? And I had a uh, I had a colleague when I first started practicing law named Tamara Kettner. She was a year ahead of me uh, as an associate at Moore and Van Allen. And my first year as a as a lawyer, I had a hearing in federal court. It was my first one that I was going to do by myself. And, uh, and so as I was preparing for the hearing, I mean, I, you know, the hearing started at nine 30 and I got into the office at six and I was, you know, I was ready to roll and I, you know, did all this prep work. And, uh, and so she came into my office before I was about to leave for the courtroom and she said, uh, big day today, I first hearing. And I said, yeah, you know, she says, are you ready? And I said, I, I'm absolutely ready. And we talked about how much work I'd done. And she said, do you know where to sit? It's like, no, I don't. <laughs> and, uh, and she walked me through all the nuts and bolts of the hearing, sort of the local rules, that particular judge, how to enter my exhibits into evidence and exactly when I did it. And had I gone in there without her, I would have gotten through it, but I probably would have had stains all over me. And she empathized enough with a colleague to help out. And it's still, it's still Molly, one of the coolest things anybody has ever done for me. That to me is what a great colleague is, Mm -hmm. is, is Mm -hmm. understanding what your fellow colleagues are going through and being there to help. Mm -hmm. And being in your shoes. I mean, she was so in your world by asking, do you know where to sit? How cool. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, law firms, you know, some, some people have a view of law firms that they're a bunch of sharks, you know, swimming around and eating what they kill. And maybe some, some places do it that way, but it doesn't mean that you can't have intense competition among, among colleagues or among teammates, but that's sort of back to the thing about no excuses, no rationalizations. I mean, the, the, the perfect team is one that fights like hell for, for the limited playing time that, that the coach, the coaching staff has to, to give out, but you, you fight for it. And when the decision's made, you unite and move forward together. And so it, you know, accepting the consequences of competition is, is part of the deal too. So, so when, when a decision's made on, on who makes partner, how much money you get in your partnership draw, whatever it might be, you know, the, the first reaction might be, well, I did this or that, and this isn't fair, whatever, Instead of, you know, that that's kind of the excuse rationalization part instead of, well, why? Why did this happen? Maybe I need to do a better job. And it doesn't mean you did a bad job. It just means, well, if this is what I want, you know, maybe I have to do a better job and maybe I have to, to reassess and reevaluate and make some make some adjustments, make some changes and, and start looking inward first. But at the same time, understanding, hey, I'm, I'm part of a greater whole here in my basketball life. I don't remember where I heard this, but it always stuck with me is, is like all of us have a, a great understanding of what other people should do. <laughs> like I, I know what a great colleague should do. Mm-hmm. Well then, then be the colleague you want to work with. Mm-hmm. Sure. If you know what, what, what you expect from your colleagues, then be the colleague you want to work with, be the teammate you want to play with. Or, or, or if you're a leader, you know, be the leader you'd want to work for. Mm-hmm. That to me is the first kind of the first question you'd want to ask yourself. Am I doing this? So you've covered, you know, NBA drafts, right? I mean, obviously legal cases, you just talk about championships, wins, losses. I mean, you've been there. What's been the most memorable thing that you've covered? I think it's probably the championship experiences that when you cover a a final four or a championship game, because I played in that game and, you know, we were, when I played, we played in the championship game in 1986, we were the number one team in the country. And that year we won more games than any team in the history of basketball won in a single season. And we lost in the title game by, by a basket. And I'm still not over it. I think mm-hmm. you give me another 35 years, <laughs> maybe. But for some reason at the end of every game, uh, every title game, I'm always like, you know, so happy for the winner. But for some reason, my attention is always drawn to the team that loses. You know, being so close to something and not getting it uh, is a, is a feeling that you can't describe. And when, you know, when I was an assistant coach at, at Duke, you know, Duke won the the championship in 1991. That was, that was coach K's first championship. And Tommy Amaker was a teammate of mine at Duke and then a a, a fellow assistant coach. And, And one of our teammates had called him afterwards and said, did it make up for it? He said, no, it's not the same. 
you know, winning it as, as a coach is a lot different than, than going through it as a player. And so I've, I've always been, been drawn to that. And so every championship game I work is probably the, the most poignant, uh, point of competition where, where it's, it's either, you know, you're, you're, you're so thrilled and then all the mistakes you made in the game that could have cost you the game go away or you're devastated and every mistake that's made is magnified to the point of, of maddening. Dude, I still wake up at night thinking about it, right? Is what yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I never respond to that because it's very kind of them to, to talk about how important it was to them. But you don't want to, you don't want to remind them that I promise you it was more important to me. Than it was. For sure. So we end with rapid fire. I'm going to just hit you with some quick ones and you just, uh, you fire back. All right. Yep. Introvert or extrovert? Extrovert. One word to describe yourself. Laughable. Mm. What's your favorite book? <laughs> My favorite book is uh, is Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy O'Toole, which I read in high school and have read several times since. But the most recent good book I've read is uh, is called The Color of Law by uh, Richard Rothstein. It's about uh, it's about systemic racism in law uh, in our country and and how it is uh, de jure, not de facto. And it's really a fascinating book. Mm. Okay, cool. Person you'd most want to trade places with for a day? Uh, I would probably want to trade places with um, someone in a leadership position in uh, in Washington D.C. so that I could see how things worked and maybe gain a greater understanding as why it's so difficult for us to do the right thing. Mm, mm, wow, who's the toughest athlete in your opinion today? I'd have a hard time going going against Serena Williams. She's she's the best tennis player I've ever seen, uh, uh, male, female, um, just spectacular. The other one I would say is probably I'm a big, uh, big fan of, of LeBron James. Uh, I think the comparison between he and Michael Jordan uh, is is not only fair, uh, it's a it's a coin toss. Wow. Wow. So uh, who's a coach today that you'd most want to play for? Right. Besides Coach K, of course. I would say Tom Izzo would be uh, really high up on that list, although he would hate me playing for him because he'd be he'd be saying I need to I need to be tougher and a better player. He, he um, knows toughness. He does, uh, and but I'd love to play for Jay Wright uh, at at Villanova. One guy I would have loved to have played for was John Thompson uh, at Georgetown. Recently passed away. That that would have been been uh, of all the coaches in in years past. Uh, that that I was able to meet and see, uh, uh, Coach Thompson would be be number one on that list. Mm -hmm. So, who's your pick to win it all this year? Right? Who's your pick to win it all this year in college hoops? I think Gonzaga is the best team. Uh, they score so easily. I mean, heck, they they hung ninety six points on Virginia, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. unthinkable. Uh, and then Baylor is, I think, the second best team. Gonzaga is the best offensive team. Baylor's the best defensive team. It's just, you know, you feel so badly for the, the players and teams uh, that, you know, they're having to play and go through this sort of once in a lifetime. I guess every year is once in a lifetime, but uh, to go through this experience during the pandemic. Uh, and I realize that there are others that are suffering at a greater degree. I'm talking, you know, sort of relative to, to this enterprise alone. Uh, but I, I'm just hopeful, Molly, we get to the finish line because I'm not confident that we will. Uh, I think once football ends, you know, we were going to we were going to move heaven and earth to finish a football season. I don't know that we'll have the same will to do it with basketball or we should because we wouldn't start right now. And uh, if we're not going to start right now, I think it's a fair question as to whether we should continue and what message these universities are sending to the public. Like these universities are are supposed to be members of of the broader community. And we're being asked not to travel right now unless it's essential. And look what we're doing to play sports. It's an interesting, interesting contradiction in what we what we say and what we're doing. And uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but but it requires a little greater analysis than I think we've given up. The show's called Game Changer. So a quick last question. Who's a game changer or what game changer inspires you and why? Well, I, I've been inspired by uh, so many of the medical professionals out there, whether it's, uh, you know, nurses or, uh, you know, EMTs, uh, certainly the doctors and researchers on the front lines that if anyone in our society can say, I'm tired and I've had enough, 
uh, or can complain. Uh, it's 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 our frontline workers, and yet they're the they're the last ones to do so. I think I've gained more inspiration from you know those that are are striving to help others uh, against every odd and putting themselves at greater risk. You know, I had made a point, Molly, on a recent broadcast saying it, it, more along the lines of what we were just talking about with whether we should continue in sports and saying, look, these players are getting tested every day when medical professionals on their, on their campus aren't getting tested every day. And I got a message from a, uh, from a nurse saying, not only are we not getting tested every day, we're not getting tested at all. We only get tested if we're sick. And you're like, wait a minute. So we're testing athletes every day and people who are literally risking their lives in the care of others are not. And if that doesn't wake us up as to to where are our priorities in this, and again, I'm not saying we shouldn't play, but it, but where are our priorities in this whole thing, and are we really in this together? Uh, it certainly raises more questions than than answers. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jay. Here are a few of my favorite takeaways from today's show. Number one, I love this one, discomfort, it equals growth. Jay talked about how his mom put him in situations that forced him out of his comfort zone, from ballroom dancing to public speaking to drama classes. Those moments prepared him for standing in front of a judge in federal court or calling big games. Number two, if you readily accept compliments, you better be able to accept criticism. Here's how Jay thinks about criticism. If it's right and reasonable, then act upon it. If it's wrong or unreasonable, dismiss it. Number three, opportunities go to people who show up. Good stuff. When he began to work in broadcasting, Jay got paid something like $200 to call Duke games on the radio. While Jay treated every radio game like it was a championship game and the entire world was watching. And that approach, well... It obviously paid off. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.